that is quantum supremacy. You hear this thrown out a lot. So maybe a critical discussion of this. Uh, so there are other topics, idiopathic, which are related to this, idiopathic, QC, Q simulation. I don't know if I put that in the list of topics, but I can add that. So yeah, so there's a lot of topics. Uh, throw them out. So some sometime within the next week, you should probably email me and let me know which topic you're thinking about taking once I update this list on the website. Uh, and you can let me know which uh, which topic you would like to talk about in the presentation. Okay, so uh, so today I'm going to introduce uh, basics of quantum computing. And to do that, first I'll cover a little bit of basics of classical computing. So, uh, so let's talk about that. A very big overview, obviously. I cannot go into the many of the important results in great detail. So, uh, Claude Shannon. Uh, if you if you've heard of Claude Shannon before, Shannon entropy, maybe perhaps uh, he was responsible for many significant advances in communications and digital communications and and, and also uh, digital computing. So in 1937, in his master's thesis, okay, one of the most probably important master's thesis around, Shannon showed that any function that takes a Boolean n-bit Boolean string, remember we introduced these in the last class, there's an n bit Boolean string and takes it to say a single bit. Okay? So it can map say 0, 0, 0 to the bit 1, 0, 0, 0, 1 to the bit 0 and so on and so forth. It produces, you know, it takes all the 2 n bit strings, 2 to the power n bit strings and maps them to some pattern of zeros and 1s, this function. Right? So there's a there's now a two to the n sort of column vector, if you like, of uh, bits uh, of, of bits flipping between zero and one. That is this function f. It has a truth table, right? He showed that this general function, which is you can think of it as a, uh, a computer, because it's computing a result zero or one for each of the two to the power n uh, bit strings, right? And he showed that it can be computed. Using two to the n divided by n binary gates. Okay. And what I mean by gates are the very familiar gates that you're used to from your digital electronics. For example, the NOT gate, right? We've already covered the NOT gate in, uh, in quantum mechanics, but this is just uh, the um, classical equivalent, okay, uh, or using OR gate, you will be familiar with these symbols from uh, your digital electronics course. AND gate. Or XOR gate. A XOR B, which as I showed you last time is equivalent to A with modulo addition B, which we also write as A plus B mod B. Right? We talked about this kind of gate in the class, but now I'm saying the equivalent classical gates turn out to be enough to carry out any function f that takes you from the n bit bit string 0 1 to some 2 to the n dimensional uh, pattern of zeros and ones right because this function f maps all the n bit string all the 2 to the n bit strings to some pattern of zeros and 
once. Okay? And uh, what he showed in this very important thesis was that any such function, any general function can be constructed using just these gates. And in particular, he showed that there is a universal gate, which is called the NAND gate. So this is a very important result, right, for classical computing. This is the NAND gate. And he showed that even all of these gates can be made from the NAND gates, which are two bit uh, gates. Okay. And we've already in the last class I told you about the quantum version, C naught. Uh, in the quantum version, we had a C naught gate. You can also define a classical C. Okay. Classical C naught would be just as you imagine it. A going through to A and B going through to B plus A or A plus B. Okay. This is the classical C1, just like we had the quantum C1. Okay. And uh, as you can see, C0 looks very much like a C, uh, an XOR gate right here. Okay. So you can think of C0 as the quantum version of X, XOR because it's got this A plus B on the output, and one of the gates A, one of the bits A is also transmitted in the output. Okay. And you can ask, can the other gates such as NAND, for example, NAND or AND or OR, can they be generalized to a quantum uh, gate? Okay. And uh, the answer is no. Okay. The reason for this is. Whenever you take a digital gate or, or, a, or an AND gate, for example, you've gone from two qubits or two bits into one bit information, right? You've lost a bit along the way, okay? So this, uh, the, you cannot just take the AND gate or the OR gate and make it into a quantum version because you would lose the qubit along the way, okay? And so uh, basically what I'm saying is that these are, these gates, the, the gates, the classical gates, are non-invertible. That is, if I am given just A plus B, I cannot find A uh, and B. I have to have one more bit of additional information, which is either A or B. That makes the C naught, for example, reversible. Because given A and given B, I just add them together, uh, modulo 2, and I get back, say, B, for example. Okay? And that gives me both A or B. Whereas these gates, say, A, a to B going to A and B, is not reversible. So the general model of quant classical computation that you read about, which is irreversible or non-invertible, cannot be immediately generalized to quantum uh, computing or quantum uh, information. However, and this is the part I'm going to have to skip all the details of, in the 1970s there was a development which was called reversible classical computation. Okay? And they showed that by using another type of gate, using so-called Frenchian gates, which are reversible, then uh, you can implement reversible classical computation. So this was a very important result. I am obviously not going to prove these results. If you want more reading on this, both uh, the books that I've recommended in the in the course syllabus, such as uh, uh, Mervin, uh, which is one of the recommended books, or uh, Nielsen and Chuang has a chapter on uh, reversible classical computation, or at least sections on reversible classical computation, and how to make these so-called Fredkin games. What is the importance of this is, what I'm trying to say here is, 
any classical circuit that you can draw, right? You know, any of your microprocessors are running on some classical digital logic circuit, which are constructed out of these, you know, simple elements, which you are all familiar with. In fact, as I said, it's, it can be constructed from just one classical element, which is the NAND gate. And what I'm saying is, there is an equivalent reversible version of the NAND gate, which is called the Fredkin gate. And you can read in these texts about how you can construct an equivalent uh, a reversible version of, say, a classical NAND gate, which means you can then construct a classical computer that is completely reversible, right? If you have a classical computer, and this is one of the obvious classical computers that I just mentioned to you, this uh, function that takes you from 0, 1, n to 0, 1, then you can make the equivalent reversible version. And once you can make the equivalent reversible version, then you can make it quantum immediately. Okay? You can make the equivalent quantum circuit by just using, say, C0 gates. Okay? So, or in fact, uh, you have to use one more gate, which is called the Toffoli gate, which is just like the C0, except it uses two qubits to control the third qubit. Okay? So I won't go into the details there, but I'm just explaining the more general principles of quantum uh, computing. The, the end result being any classical computer or classical circuit that you can draw can be made reversible and therefore can be implemented by an equivalent quantum circuit. So that is the first big thing to understand that any classical circuit I can draw, even though it first looks non-reversible, uh, or in non-invertible, can be made reversible using this Franklin gates, and therefore can be made also using a quantum version. So given that result, we can say that given any classical circuit that I can draw on the on my you know or I can come up with, I can construct a unitary matrix or a unitary circuit, quantum circuit, that will implement that particular function. Remember, the original thing was I needed to implement some function. The function is taking any n bit string to a 2 to the n dimensional column vector of zeros and ones. That is what a function, that's what a computer looks like in a binary logic, right? A computer in binary logic takes all the n bit strings 0, uh, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, up to 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1 in n bits to some pattern of zeros and ones, okay? And I'm just explaining to you or stating without proof that we can in fact construct an equivalent quantum circuit that can implement that function through a unitary matrix. Okay, what does that mean then for the state vectors? Is this clear, this point? This is an important point before we proceed to discussing the uh, quantum version of this. Okay. For those of you who came late, these are some additional topics for final project presentation. Uh, I was just telling the rest of the class about that, and uh, and I put that also on the list. So within the next week or so, please email me your choice of topic so that we can uh, assign the presentations. Okay, so we have made this. Big claim, obviously I'm not proving it. A lot of the details are in your uh, textbooks that I've assigned or recommended for reading. So if you are curious about that, you can read more details there. So the mental perspective that we are adopting from now on out is the following. Okay. I'll just state it in sort of uh, pictures, or and then I'll I'll tell you in in with equations. Okay. The idea is that if I take any n bit string x, okay, zero zero up to zero, going up to one 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 one, this is an n bit string, right? Binary strings. And therefore, there are two to the n uh, of them, right? Okay. Uh, so I'll call that the number of such strings is capital N. 
which is 2 to the power n, right? And any function of these, f of x, uh, uh, Shannon considered only those uh, which will convert, uh, which will create, say, 0, 1, 1, 1, 0, blah, 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 up to 0. So this is one such string. It's a truth table, right? It's just like a truth table that you construct for a digital gate. This is a truth table for the function x. Okay. So uh, Shannon only considered these uh, 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 functions. So this is so in Shannon, this is taking you from the state zero one up to uh, the zero one. Uh, uh, this, is the, this is the mapping. We are going to consider a generalization of this uh, function f, which takes us from zero one n to the complex numbers c. Okay. So now, instead of zeros, I will replace by C1, C2, up to C capital N. Okay. This is the truth table of the function, which is really, it's a vector, right? This is a vector, C1 column vector, Cn, okay, C1 up to Cn, right? And this is the equivalently, you can think of it as a truth table of a function, that takes you from the n bit strings to the complex numbers. And for a lot of things, in fact, even just considering these as either real numbers, uh, you know, or even as uh, you know, uh, binary strings, as we will see, uh, just in, in fact, even this first function here will already teach us a lot about uh, quantum uh, computation. Okay, but this is the most general uh, result, and of course, this c1 up to cn we know is an n qubit quantum state which is c1 0 0 plus c2 uh, 0 0 1 plus cn 1 1 1 okay uh, of course, I need to normalize this, so that's one additional consideration that we have to keep in mind, which introduces a little bit of sometimes, uh, uh, you know, notational or complexity, but we will we, we can take care of it. Okay. So any function x going to f of x, where uh, f of x uh, f of x uh, creates a complex number, is equivalent to a column vector, which is equivalent to an n qubit uh, quantum state. In fact, we'll go additionally. We'll uh, we will make a slightly uh, different um, um, modification of this, which is we will consider an n qubit input register, which are in the state x n, x representing, as I've said before, all the binary uh, n n bit strings. Okay. And I'll consider another set of m qubit, m can be equal to n, and these are called the output registers, okay. which I call y m. Okay. Oh, so the equivalent uh, description of this could be if I were to write it, it would be summation f of x, x, n, right? Uh, f, capital F. And x is equal to all the binary strings in f2 of n, or is equal to all the binary strings from 0, uh, 0, 0, 0 up to 1, 1, 1, and I have to normalize this simply, okay? What, what should I normalize? Okay, that is a consideration we'll come back to later on, but this is the general situation. Okay? And the general feature of a quantum computer now, because I already told you any uh, classical computer which uh, produces some output, uh, like this truth table, for example, can be implemented by an equivalent quantum uh, circuit. Um, we view the quantum computer as carrying out the following operation.
the substitutes n and m here, again I'm just indicating that this is the n qubit quantum state and the m qubit uh, quantum state, produces the following result. So it takes this and adds it modulo f of x. Remember f of x is going to be some uh, complex number and we are going to be able to produce some integer. Uh, so let, let, let's just do this uh, simple example, okay, which will make it maybe a little bit clearer. If y is equal to 0, then uf of xm 0m produces xm f of x m. Okay? So I can either view this as the coefficients in the quantum state or I can imagine there's an additional output register, okay, another set of n qubits on which I have produced a state which looks like this, okay, which has got the pattern of f of x stored in it. And uh, uf is its own inverse. The reason for that is straightforward. uf acting on itself will produce the same identity state. I'm now going to simplify the notation. This is uf x y plus f of x is equal to x y plus f of x again on the side on the answer qubits which is going to produce x sorry <laughs> blocked by this hopefully you can see that can you see it it's down in the corner here um, if you can't see it I'll write it over there so that guy over here is simply x y plus f of x plus f of x is equal to x y. Okay. okay, so that's the general action of a quantum circuit is to produce this kind of uh, behavior. And so what does that help, how does that help us? So there are all these different mental perspectives, but essentially we are just manipulating these kinds of states over here, okay? summarize this algorithm, if you like, of a quantum computer as the following. First we rotate it, and I'll explain what this means, then we compute, and then we rotate again. Okay? This is the algorithm for every quantum algorithm so far. Okay? Rotate, compute, and rotate it, okay? And yeah, but of course the question is how do you do this cleverly? So let us uh, start with the n qubit states, uh, you know, which are say 0, 0. Okay? So these are the n qubits that were in the input quantum register, remember? That I had described earlier, okay? What I'm going to do is I'm going to apply Hadamard to each of them. This is the rotation part, okay? Okay? So 
this is the n qubit input register. Okay. So let us look at the state that is coming out over here at this point, time two. So this is time one, this is time two. Okay. This is what we want to understand. What is the state of the input register after the Hadamard has been applied on this? The Hadamard are one qubit operations, so we can apply them without uh, much difficulty, presumably in a quantum computer. Okay. So at this n. Uh, the action of n Hadamards is also denoted as h n because it means h direct product over all of the n uh, qubits. So h n acting on the state 0 n, okay. So Hadamard acting on each one of these is simply 1 over root 2, okay, 0 plus 1 on the first qubit times 1 over root 2, 0 plus 1 on the second qubit plus so on and so forth, uh, times so on and so forth, up to the n cube. And as you can immediately see, as I start multiplying out these states, I will get, let's say take two qubits, they've already seen this, you'll get 0, 0, right, plus uh, 1, 0, plus 0, 1, plus 1, 1. That is all the possible two qubit or two bit strings or two qubit uh, states that are possible. Okay? So if you generalize to n qubits, you see that this pattern will give you all the possible n bit strings in one giant superposition with some uh, simple uh, normalization uh, because we know exactly what those 1 over root 2's are going to add up to, the 1 over root 2 to the power n. Okay? So the output at time 2 of this quantum circuit okay, I should have written it up here then I could have continued um, is it okay if I just write this result here so the result here is simply 1 over root 2 to the power n summation over x equal to 0 up to 2 to the n minus 1 of x n and of course, this 2 to the n minus 1 is also in that number n, so this is equal to n minus 1. Okay? Is that clear? Right? x, remember, has all the possible n bit strings in it, so this is the uniform superposition of all the n bit uh, strings. So with probability uh, uniformly, you know, because it's got all the same coefficients over here, um, we have made the superposition that of all the n bit uh, input uh, strings. Okay, that's hopefully easy enough for everyone. Now we apply, as I said, the Simon's uh, famous statement, we apply the UF. And remember UF, which is this giant uh, circuit over here, remember it has it has to put its output on M uh, input uh, or M output uh, registers. So it's going to produce the same, so actually I should extend this down here. So let me erase this just a minute, so it would have been better to write it over here. Okay. H, and I'll just summarize this as H, n acting on the state 0, 0, n is equal to this uniform superposition. Okay? And uh, uf, remember, needs outputs, so our, our uh, ancillas or answer register or whatever you want to call them, which are, say, m uh, qubits, which are coming in, which in the most general case have been initialized to some state ym. Okay? Uh, in fact, we'll see later, without loss of generality, we can take this also to be 0m. But for now, assume that it's just ym. Then uf, acting on this uniform superposition, is going to produce the output
is going to produce the output that we claim, which is 1 over root 2 to the power n, summation x equal to 0 to n minus 1, xm, y plus f of x. Okay? That was, after all, how we said that the uf is going to act. And as I said, if I assume that the y started in the state 0, then this is in fact just going to give the state fx back to me. Okay? So let us assume in fact for now, and I'll, I'm not showing why this is allowed, but it's fairly simple because any state ym that I could make with 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, whatever you want to construct with the appropriate single qubit gates can be constructed from 0, 0, 0, 0, m. Right? So if I had some pattern 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 0, then looking at wherever I see a 0, a 1, I put a NOT gate in front of that and I will produce from the 0 m state. So I am saying that by just some action of some unitary gates, okay, um, which uh, I will call some other g of x or g of y, okay, uh, I, can, uh, I can produce that from 0 m. Some, some simple unitary operation. So let's put y of m equal to 0 of m. Okay? If I set that, then in fact the output of the quantum computer at this point is 1 over root 2 to the n, summation x equal to 0 and minus 1, x m f of x. Okay. So the output then of this quantum computer consists of a state where the entire uh, action of that truth table, remember that whole truth table that I had written on, and this I'm already just restating what you already know, that the entire action of f by just one action, by one application of this magic uf uh, operator has produced all the uh, answers for that truth table in just this one state which is written down here. So I only have to act with my quantum circuit one time and I get the result of f as though it has acted on every one of these 2 to the n minus 1 inputs all at once with one application. Okay, so this is supposed to, supposedly this is what we call quantum parallelism. You might have some complicated function which you want to evaluate, okay? And what you have done is by using this encoding into the Hilbert space, you have found the application or the truth table of that uh, function f of x by simply one application of the circuit because that answer is now encoded in this quantum uh, state over here. So for example, if n is equal to 100, uh, then this is 2 to the n minus 1 evaluations of the function. is on the order of 10 to the 3, uh, 300 time evaluation. Okay? Uh, 10 to the 300 seems like a large number, but nowadays, I mean, you know, uh, your PlayStations, for example, you know, if you buy a PlayStation uh, for a few hundred dollars, that operates at something like 5 teraflops, okay? Which is nothing but 5 times 10 to the 12 floating point operations per second, okay? So, 10 to the 300, as you can see, would require roughly 10 to the 88 seconds for you to realize, right? Uh, sorry, uh, 10 to the uh, 288 uh, realize, uh, seconds for you to evaluate the same function on a PlayStation if it was running, you know, on, let's say this was like some simple floating point operation. You can now see the massive parallelism uh, that you've gained by having this uh, quantum circuit that can do this, this operation. But there is a problem. What's the problem?
what is the problem of claiming that you have achieved some kind of massive parallelism uh, with this quantum state. I'm done, right? This is, this is all I needed. I needed to have the function f of x evaluated uh, 10 to the 300 times and it's there in the quantum state. So read it out, right? That's it, you're done. What's the problem? Why are we working so hard? Or well, what more do you need to know about quantum algorithms if that's all there was to this problem? What happens when I read it out? What will I get? Do I get n 2 to the n minus 1 results? How many results do I get? Huh? One result. So that's the problem. When I read out the state of the quantum computer, I'm going to get one set of bits over here, some x, in this massive superposition, which is uniformly random, as I told you, right? Uniformly random, you understand, right? It's like, I imagine I flipped a coin n times, right? Then there is a chance 1 over 2 to the n that I'll get any one of the bit strings 0, 0, 0, 0 up to 1, 1, 1, okay? And with that bit string in the output register, I will get the function f of x that has been evaluated on that particular bit string, right? Okay. Which is great, but it only gives me, it's the equivalent of simply doing this operation that I just mentioned, taking n coins, tossing them, okay? I get some binary output string, okay? Depending on the pattern of heads and tails, I get some 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, blah, blah, blah. Put that into a deterministic quantum computer, uh, a deterministic classical computer, which evaluates f at that one random position, okay? Or random uh, set of strings. So it seems like all the classical computer looks like to me in this point is it's, if I measured it at this point, if I did a measurement of the output at this point, would be equivalent to a classical deterministic computer with randomness put into it. Right? So it is like a random classical computer or a non-deterministic classical computer. And actually, this is another model of classical computation that was explored in the 80s and 90s. Okay, to see if it can add any power to the normal models of classical computing. And the answer was not much. Okay? There are some problems for which it's suited. You've all probably heard of these in computational methods in physics like Monte Carlo simulations, you can use that, you know, kind of randomization, but you can also equally use a machine to just generate the random numbers and do these kind of simulations. So, so back to my point, simply measuring at this point would be a mistake, okay? And so, uh, it, so the output result of, uh, of this, if I make a measurement, just erase this, this is just to explain the kind of order of magnitude improvements that people so, I mean, I, I, probably if you are only aware of quantum computing from the media, a lot of times, this is where they'll stop. Okay, they'll just say, oh, this is massive quantum parallelism, and if you read the media, then that's it. You know, you're done. You, you have achieved, you achieved some greatness, but as quantum mechanics, we know that, oh, this is nothing useful at all. In fact, when you measure this, you'll get some random x naught random x naught, which, which is the output, some random value among all the 2 to the n minus 1 bit strings, uh, 2 to the n bit strings, and uh, some value f of x naught. Okay? So you do get that, but you could just as well have gotten that by simply flipping some coins, get, uh, looking at the result, and then feeding that into a deterministic computer that evaluated the function f, and if you search like this, it will take you 2 to the n realizations of all the strings to map out the entire function f of x. Okay? So what have you gained? Okay? Nothing, right? <laughs> uh, there is one thing that though if you could do, 
that you could actually make this uh, uh, state work for you. Okay, which is uh, we call this the state psi, right? Let's call this the state psi of the quantum computer. Okay, which is given by this massive superposition of x and f of x in the input and output register. So this is the state psi over here of the quantum computer. Okay, in the inputs and the outputs. Well, imagine I had some machine available, okay, which takes the state psi, okay, some machine U, okay, and then produces a copy of the state psi, okay. In fact, if you want, I'll generate, you know, let's have one more qubit that this guy can use, initialize that into the state zero, and now I've got you know, uh, this other state u that produces the state psi with another copy of the state psi put in here. If I had this machine, which I call a cloner, okay, because it clones or copies, it's a Xerox machine, right? It copies state psi twice, okay? If I had such a machine, then actually, that's all I need. I put that machine over here. Okay, I make two copies of state psi, or maybe I make n copies of state psi, right? Just add the add, add the machine n times. Okay. Now I have n copies of the state psi, and now I can measure. Each one will give me a random value, x naught, f of x naught. Okay. But I have now evaluated massively, massive with massive parallelism, all the results of this superposition. And I have learned all the values of f of x naught with one action of uf and two to the n of these cloning machines. Okay? Still a lot of machines, but at least in principle we have achieved this speed up, so you might say. Of, because maybe this is the difficult circuit to make, and this one is the easy one. Okay. If you could achieve, or if you could make this cloner, you could make copies of this state, measure it each time, get a pair x naught f of x naught, and you could learn a lot about the function f by this uh, by this method. But as you can imagine, this function or this sorry this machine, the cloner, can never be made. Okay. And this is the famous no cloning theorem of quantum computing. Or point of information. So, by the way, I erase this, but just remember this pattern uh, that we were using, which is rotate, compute, rotate, because I'll come back to it when we discuss actual quantum algorithms. Okay? So, the theorem, the no cloning. Here. states that the statement is there is no unitary transformation that takes state psi n 0 m, let's just generalize to m qubits into state, uh, let me actually start with just one qubit over here because the result is equivalent for uh, all, uh, you know, uh, the state um, psi, psi, some with some function of psi m minus one. Okay. Where what I've said is the state psi and the state zero m are input into the machine. This is the state zero m, right? M qubit 
uh, input register or answer register and here is our cloning machine okay u which now takes this makes the original psi another copy psi and then in the other m minus 1 qubits uh, produces some state f of psi okay which uh, it's critical that this f of psi be unentangled with these two right because then we can just discard it it's just some garbage Okay. It's just some garbage, don't care about it, throw it away. Okay. I have my two important states, psi, that I really care about. And remember in particular, we are not interested just in one qubit states, but uh, in that sort of that n qubit superposition, this quantum parallelism state, eventually we'll want to make something that will clone that state. But for now, let's just take the one qubit state and show the result, and then it's easy to generalize to n. Okay. Okay. So there are several proofs of this uh, theorem, uh, but the one I'm going to do is by just like looking at uh, this simple uh, construction and showing that it will immediately run into uh, trouble. Okay. So let's now input the state for psi as zero. Okay. U acting on zero times 0 m right produces now the state 0 0 right so those two qubits the first two qubits have become 0 0 times some function of 0 for the other m qubits And again, I want to remind you, f of say some general x, the scale, is this superposition f of x, x, m, okay, with some normalization, which I'm not worrying about over here. It, it encodes, as I was saying, a two qubit, uh, sorry, a, uh, a, a truth table or an n qubit Hilbert space. Uh, is the is the equivalent of like essentially writing down all the answers for the f for the evaluation of the function f uh, over the by using this bit string uh, uh, x xf as your input. Okay, so just a reminder from the earlier uh, thing. Okay, okay. so yes. Now, of course, this guy should also do the same. If I start with the state zero, that should produce one one times some function of one times f. And okay, that's all obvious enough. Now let's consider superposition, which is the state plus. Well, I better get two copies of the state plus plus uh, times some function that depends on the plus uh, on this output string. Okay. okay, very good. Well, now you begin to see the way in which this proof uh, is going to go. I'm going to add these two equations together and divide by root. So 1 and 2, and let's call this 3. So 1 plus 2 divided by root 2, okay? You can clearly see what that's going to be. That's u of uh, plus, right? Cross with 0, 0, 0, right? Because when I add the left hand side, that's 1 over root 2, 0 and 1 over root 2, 1 added together. That's the state plus is going to give me on the other side 1 over root 2, 0, 0 cross f0 plus 1 over root 2, 1, 1 cross with f1. Okay? But number 3, which is this equation, I can expand it, right? So what is that going to expand to on the right hand side? Well, it's 1 over root 2, 
0 plus 1 times 1 over root 2 0 plus 1 times f of plus, right? And I can write this out. This is going to be 1 over 2, uh, just straight forward, 0, 0, plus 1 over 2, 1, 1, plus 1 over, uh, 0, 1, plus 1 over 2, 1, 0, plus 1 over 2, 1, 1, times f of plus. Okay. And the claim is if this is a true cloning machine, these two states should be identical to each other. But yeah, first of course we have the problem of these f of plus and f of zero, but we don't care. Because remember these were garbage qubits, we were going to throw away the answer in the end anyway, so it doesn't matter what happens to them, I don't care. But what if I measure the states, the first two qubits? Okay, so measure the first two qubits. Okay, then the, you can write down the probabilities right away. This is similar to that proof I showed you earlier that an entangled state can never be written as the product of two separate states, as we can immediately see. If I measure qubit one and qubit two, so I'm, uh, you know, then the first uh, call this say star, and this is star star. Okay, star is going to give me probabilities are going to be one half for the state zero zero, one half for the state one one, and zero for all s possibilities. Whereas star star is going to give me probabilities is going to is going to basically give me all of the uh, strings with probability one quarter, right? Probability is one quarter for the strings zero, zero, one. And so you see by either direct measurement or whichever way you want to call it, there is no way that these two states can ever be equal, okay? The most general proof you can take instead of zero and uh, zero uh, plus one over root two, you could have chosen a times 0 plus b times 1 divided by root by whatever you want and carried out the algebra you would have found once again on one side it is you know some product of a squared and b squared and a b and on the other side it, it can never achieve that same uh, probability okay the, the same uh, copies or whatever you want to call them okay? and that, that proof is in Berman. I just showed you like a simple version of it using very specific numbers for 0, 1, uh, 0 plus 1 and, and so on. Also in Merman, if you look at it or uh, any other textbook, you might, you might be asked, well, what if it's not exactly equal but approximately equal, right? Maybe I don't want it to be perfect, that initial quantum state that I created, that massively parallel quantum state. I don't want an exact copy. I'm happy with maybe an approximate copy, okay? So imagine now, uh, so, is this proof clear? So this is an important result, right? No cloning theorem. Uh, you'll often hear, for example, questions about this theorem uh, from people. Uh, you know, maybe there's some counterexample which proves that this is uh, not possible. And usually these counterexamples, uh, the standard example that you might have heard of is stimulated emission, right? So you know, you guys know about stimulated emission in an atom, right? We have talked about it in quantum optics as well. Imagine you have an incoming photon on an atom, which is in the state, excited state, the output from the stimulated emission in the master equation, for example, could be two photons and the atom in the ground state. In James Cummings model or in, in, uh, in uh, master equation is the atom goes to the ground state, but you get two photons out in the excited, coming out of the system, both of them are in the same quantum state, right? That's what James Cummings model, for example, tells you, okay? Well, that seems like it violates the no cloning theorem. Right? Because now I got two copies of a photon, right? Which was in some unknown quantum state, I don't know what it was. And the output came out to be in the, uh, to be two of the same number uh, with the atom in the ground state, okay? Well, the unfortunate situation is the atom can also emit spontaneously. So, 
the output is no longer entangled is no longer unentangled with the garbage photon which is the garbage photon would be the spontaneous emission photon so there's a if you write if you write the state of the system and evolve it using master equation or evolve it using any other me mechanism you want you find that there is an entangled part of this spontaneous emission photon with the initial state of the photon what i'm saying is let's say input is one photon times atom in the excited state Okay. Then the process you are looking for is one photon, one photon, this is stimulated emission times atom in the ground state. That's oh, right. The ground state. Okay? Right? This is the stimulated emission process. Well, unfortunately, there is the other process. Uh, call this cavity, just to make things a little bit easier. This is the cavity mode in James Cummings model. or in the, So that is the photon that you can extract from the cavity and you can use it, oh, you, you achieve the, the result uh, of, of cloning. Uh, the problem is that there is this other process which in principle is almost impossible to contain, which is that you get the state 1 uh, C with 1 in some spontaneous emission photon times the atom in the ground state and since these two uh, possibilities are uh, resulting in the same general uh, situation you have to add the amplitudes so let's say the final state of the system psi is some a times one cavity one cavity times atom in the ground state plus one cavity uh, some probability one uh, uh, spontaneous emission ground atom and so you see this is in general an entangled state of the atom and the cavity uh, and the vacuum uh, so to speak of the of the spontaneous okay so that kind of illustrates the problems you usually run into when you try to uh, violate the no cloning theorem is the, the the general result is there is usually some other channel that becomes entangled with your channel that you're interested in and that results, remember, we wanted these garbage or whatever photons uh, that are coming out to be completely unentangled. Because otherwise we don't get a faithful reproduction of the original amplitude. Okay. okay, to finish the result, what if you could make a system U, okay, which uh, takes the input psi and again has a say, say zero, produces psi, psi, but not quite, I, I don't know, I'll make a new symbol, it's approximately psi. So it's not exactly the state psi, but approximate. You know, I make this baby approximation symbol. If I made this machine, then maybe I could do just as good as having a machine that does it perfectly, right? And uh, okay, so immediately you can see that uh, suppose I start with the state psi, and uh, of course we have our uh, qubit zero, which is the input uh, qubit. I claim that this is approximately psi psi, and I have say some state phi with zero, approximately it will give me phi phi, right? That's how this machine should work through the action of this u, this approximate u operator. Well. Uh, now I can take the inner product between these two uh, things on the left hand side and on the right hand side. Okay, let's take the inner product of the left hand side. Okay, phi zero, psi zero. Okay, well this should be equal to zero zero phi psi, right? On the left hand side, but I can also insert in this middle here the unitary operator. U because that's an identity operator and then by using this guy that should be equal to psi phi whole square right same argument that is basically u acting on psi zero gives me two copies psi psi u dagger acting on phi zero from the left will give me two copies of phi phi and therefore this guy will be psi Phi size, right? Same. 
As you can see, these two can never be equal to each other because this guy is just one. So this implies that phi psi squared is approximately phi psi. This is only true if phi psi is either zero or one. So either the two states are exactly identical to each other or almost identical to each other to begin with or they were or they were orthogonal to each other. So th for those special states then what we have proven is that in fact we can clone those states. <coughs> if the states are exactly identical to each other then of course we can clone it because we started with two copies of the same state. Okay. <laughs> and if they are identical to each other then uh, or orthogonal to each other then of course we can clone them because we have information about the uh, relationship between the states. Okay, because again we started with two copies of the same state. So, okay, so that uh, concludes my proof of the no cloning theorem. Uh, so, just a few remarks about this. Um, so, uh, first of all, uh, we have said that we cannot copy an arbitrary quantum state psi into some arbitrary copies, two copies, let's say, of the same arbitrary quantum state psi, unknown quantum state. And that is the whole key of this. The state psi has to be unknown to begin with. If I have a known quantum state, there is no problem. Okay? For example, let's say I have the state 0, I know it's 0. I can always make some machine that makes more copies of 0. So I know the amplitude to be in either 0 or 1. In this case, the amplitude is 1 to be in the state 0. Therefore, I just make an equivalent copy of that same thing because I know the amplitude of the state. Okay? The problem is when I have an unknown state, psi, I can't make a, make a cloner that makes an exact copy of this unknown state. Okay, it's sort of something about the unknowability, if you like, or unlearnability of an unknown state psi. Which doesn't rule out learning something about the state psi if I have many copies of it. And this is in fact a common procedure when you do experimental quantum information uh, science. Uh, for example, uh, let's say I create some entangled state between a spin qubit and a photon qubit. And my goal is to prove that I have created such an entangled state. Well, what I have to do is I have to repeat the, repeat the preparation procedure many, many times. And each time I can measure some information about the system that allows me to learn something about the actual quantum state. So what I'm saying is I have not said that you cannot do this. That is, if you, if you were to think about what is the problem, let's just stick to the one qubit uh, situation, for example. <coughs> the no cloning theorem tells us that we cannot, that there is something fundamentally unknowable about a quantum state because it has got these two amplitudes A and B or alpha and beta but if I had many copies say M copies or N copies of the same unknown quantum state then yes I can learn learn alpha, beta, the amplitudes for this quantum state. This learning process is called quantum state tomography. Tomography, they could have just as well called it quantum state knowing or quantum state learning, but they decided to call it quantum state tomography. I guess so similar to like, you know, medical terminology, tomography of of the body or something like that. Okay. Something unknown. Okay. All right. The other thing that is uh, so I already mentioned, if you have known states like zero or one, you can always clone them, right? If you have some uh, single photon emitter uh, and you want to create single photons that are in say the vertical polarization or horizontal polarization, just take your single photon emitter, put a horizontal or vertical polarizer in front of it, and you get. A, uh, the horizontal or uh, vertical polarized single photons. Okay, um, so there are other things. Uh, people have considered other ways in which you could violate. Uh, maybe that uh, transformation is not completely unitary. Remember, we everything hinged on the fact that that cloner has to be a unitary operator, right? So what if it's not a unitary operator? What if inside this cloner I allow it to make some measurements? So it's not completely unitary. Okay. You might say, aha, now I have a way to violate this theorem because the U is no longer unitary, but I'm certainly allowed to measure things in the lab, so I'll just construct something. Turns out, this also turns out not to be true because any such system, it, it can be proven, which has internal measurements in it, 
can be rewritten as a system with a unitary operator and some measurements at the end. Okay? And so that means it's exactly like our cloning machine with some measurements which throw away the garbage uh, qubits at the end, okay? which are just measured. So they're just some numbers and we throw them away or we keep them, whatever, doesn't matter. So once again, we come into the same result that we need to have a unitary operator that can exactly clone the state. So again, I'm deferring uh, or, or saying that that's you know, not something that I'm going to explain or discuss, but it, it, it is a general result by Wouters and others that you know you cannot uh, make this generalizations. Okay. Uh, but uh, this is an important step and so you know just so you know that you know by learning about a quantum state, if I have many copies of it, does not violate the no cloning uh, theorem and that's in fact experimentally how we learn about whether we have created an entangled state or even how we have learned about how to create a, a single qubit, uh, single, single qubit state. Okay. okay, now I've talked about no cloning theorem uh, and I've said that I cannot give, create two copies of the same unknown quantum state psi. Okay, and I said it's because I can't know anything about the state psi in some sense. If I measure it, if I directly measure it, then with some probability alpha squared or a squared, whatever you want to call it, I get the result 0, with some probability b squared, I get the result 1. Maybe I can do some phase estimation once in a while, learn something about their superposition, but I cannot do all this, you know, simultaneously, unless I have many copies of the state psi, right? So, and certainly, if once I learn all these copies of the state psi, I can then transmit that information to you classically. I can send you a text message and say, oh, hey, alpha equals 1 and 1 over root 2 and beta equals 1 over root 2, that is my unknown quantum state. Now you just write down that state on your paper or you make your own state in the lab with a 45 degree polarizer and you're done. Okay, but that's, that requires, you know, just many, many copies of the state psi and some measurements and then classical communication to learn something about the state psi. That's not very uh, fancy or interesting. But there is one very interesting idea, uh, which is, Without learning anything about the state psi, I just know I have some unknown quantum state. I can tell, I can send that state over to you without learning anything about it. Okay, and magically, it will appear in your location. Okay, as long as I destroy my original state psi. So this is a way in which I can destroy one copy and create another copy somewhere else. Okay, this. If you know anything about Star Trek or other places, other you know things, this is called teleportation. Okay, teleportation means I scan some object effectively, like in, in Star Trek, if you've ever seen these science fiction movies or episodes, in Star Trek, what happens is you know the hero, Kirk or Spock or whatever, will step up to the transporter, transporter or teleporter machine, they'll get scanned by some computer which will learn everything about the location of the atoms in their body. Then they'll get destroyed. Effectively, it looks like you know in the, in the in the movies or whatever. It looks like they get destroyed. Okay, and then a copy of them is created at some location somewhere. So this is teleportation, and we are going to now discuss quantum teleportation. This actually also turns out to be a very useful primitive for many distributed quantum computing or uh, quantum communication algorithms. Okay, so I think that since it's a useful idea. You should learn about it now, and then you can read like the literature on how this is being used in many different uh, ways. Okay. So let's uh, make this problem into a game. Okay. That's how a lot of things in quantum mechanics, which is quantum games, have come about to give us insight into uh, quantum mechanics itself. Okay. So the game is as follows. Okay. There's Alice, and then Bob. Okay. And Alice and Bob are great friends, you know, they, they, maybe they went to Pitt together for graduate school, right, and uh, got their PhDs in physics, okay, and uh, now Bob, uh, let's say, uh, is going to travel maybe across the country to, I don't know, maybe sunny California for some time because he's tired of the winter weather in, uh, in Pittsburgh, so he decides to go to California, and, let me just keep my tie here. Okay, I'm almost out of time. Okay, uh, what I'm going to do is just summarize the, the idea and then in the next class I'll explain how it works. Okay, so Bob is going off to some other location, uh, I don't know, uh, say, California. Okay, 
All right, it doesn't matter. Uh, or maybe he decides to go on a spaceship to Mars. Okay, so he's going off to Mars. And this is a future where you know he can go wherever he wants, and so you know we he he goes off to Mars. And Alice over here, you know, she's a great uh, experimental physicist. She makes some state psi, which is very interesting. Okay, uh, very very interesting state psi. You know, nobody has measured this, and you know she's very excited about the state psi, and she wants to tell Bob about it. Okay. She wants to give him the state sign. See what an amazing quantum state sign that I made with my wonderful quantum uh, machine, my quantum computer. Oh, but there's a problem. Bob is over there in California or, or Mars. How do I get the state psi over to, to Bob? Uh, you know, I know from the no cloning theorem, I can't you know, uh, just make a copy of it and send it to him. Uh, so what is Alice going to do? Alice is very clever, right? And Alice and Bob are both great friends. So even before Bob left on this uh, uh, adventure to Mars or to California or whatever, uh, uh, Bob and Alice, being such good friends, they decided, hey, you know what? We can make entangled states in the lab. Okay. So in addition to this unknown quantum state psi, uh, Bob and Alice, and this is a common, uh, you know. They shared a Bell state before they before they left. Okay, Alice and Bob are great friends, so you know they were both like, oh yeah, we have to stay in touch in a truly quantum way. So let's create some entanglement between us. Okay, and let's create this entangled pair and uh, share it. Uh, you keep one in your pocket, and I'll keep one in my pocket, or maybe I'll put it in my very nice bill fridge uh, or fridge or whatever that I have or my. In my uh, quantum uh, atomic memory or my quantum NP center memory, I'll put it in there. It'll live there forever. Okay, it's going to stay there. We have also in this uh, distant future, we have already created ways to like take two entangled particles and just keep them there without looking at them forever inside a nice you know box uh, in their pocket, whatever, so that they don't have to ever worry about losing this entanglement. Okay. All right, this is an amazing future if it was possible, right? So, okay, so, so then Alice over here, same side, okay, also has an entangled pair with Bob over here. This is Alice, this is Bob, okay. And they share this one more particle, uh, uh, that is Alice has this particle, which is sitting in Alice's location. Bob over here does not have the state sign, okay, he was not. He, you know, went off, did something else. You know, he went to Mars. He was busy. You know, so he didn't have time to, in the lab, make this amazing quantum state psi. So now he has to. Uh, he wants to learn about it. He's like, I'm over in Mars. I'm bored. You know, or California. I'm bored. I want to learn about this quantum state psi. So please send it to me. And now we have to come up with this idea. Can I? Can Alice, in fact, send the state over to Bob without? Uh, measuring it effectively, right? She cannot measure it because if she did it, she would lose this quantum state, and you know she would not be able to transmit it over to Bob. And the whole protocol, this machine that we are going to build, which is the quantum teleporter, okay, is going to result in something where Bob now ends up with the state. Psi, and now Alice unfortunately has something. Okay, but it is no longer the state side. She has lost the state side. But Bob now has the state side, which is okay then. Now he can send it back using this run the quantum teleporter in reverse. And now Alice has it again. And Bob has had some time maybe to play with the state side, so he's very happy, and everything is great. Okay. Uh, and the way in which we are going to describe this protocol is that Alice, by making use of these two particles which are in this entangled state, plus two classical bits of communication. Okay, and so this, this quantum teleportation protocol, which was invented by Bennett and Brasser in 1993, they, were, they came up with this quantum teleportation protocol. Uh, they, uh, you know, they, they came up with this uh, this idea, and uh, the point is that we can use this 
um, not only to, uh, to, 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 to do this, but also it has a fundamental sort of impact, which, which is often summarized as this, one entangled pair plus one plus two bits of classical communication or two bits as it's often just abbreviated is equivalent to one qubit. Okay? So it kind of says that you know by, by taking an entangled pair and making some measurements on it, I have the equivalent of uh, one qubit. I gave away that I'm making measurements, but you probably guessed that when I said classical qubits. Um, but uh, uh, so therefore we we have a sort of more it says something, you can think of it as saying that a qubit is more dense than just two classical bits. Right? If I have two classical bits, you would think that you know a qubit is after all just zero plus one, right? Some a times zero plus b times one. But what this result is saying is a qubit in fact encodes more information in it than just two bits of classical information. So this is something in quantum information theory is referred to as super dense coding. Okay? This is, this is another jargon or whatever you want to call this is this is super dense coding. And the reason is, as I just explained, that one qubit to transmit it really requires me to have more than just two bits of classical information, requires an entire entangled pair, plus maybe more stuff that I have to do just to get the information about one uh, qubit. So, okay. So in the next class, I'll explain to you how quantum teleportation works, and then we'll come back to the quantum algorithm. In fact, we'll jump straight into some of the most famous uh, quantum algorithms that have been uh, invented. Okay. So before I forget, let me take pictures of this so that I don't forget to put all of them on the on the list for the. Uh, So I think there was a homework due, I don't know if anyone has finished it.